In my personal devotions, I have always simply read through the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. I usually follow this pattern. I read one psalm every day, uh, starting at the first psalm and reading through the end and then starting over again. And then I read, beginning in Genesis, three chapters of the Old Testament and beginning in Matthew, one chapter of the New Testament every day. And if I uh, do that consistently, if I were to do it and not miss a day, it would take about 10 months to get through the Bible. In my reading, it happens that this week I started reading 1 Samuel. Uh, and in my previous reading of the books of Samuel, I've learned that Samuel is about, uh, really, it tells the story of the end of the period of the judges and uh, the downward spiral that Israel experienced under the judges and then the subsequent rise of the monarchy under David. Now, the first three chapters uh, are about the birth of Samuel, who is both the last judge and is a prophet. Samuel was born to a childless mother named Hannah. She went up with her husband to one of the feasts of Israel, uh, at that time the tabernacle and the high priest were in the city of Shiloh and they would go there and while she's there she prays that God will give her a son and, and when she prays she makes a promise to the Lord that if he gives her a son she will give that child to the Lord for his service as a Nazarite. Now, a Nazarite uh, is a very special class of devoted people in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the restrictions uh, or the story of a Nazarite person is found in Numbers chapter 6. And there are a number of important Nazarites in the Old Testament, including Samson and Samuel. And it's possible that John the Baptist himself was a, a Nazarite. But uh, shortly after this, Hannah returns home and she becomes pregnant and gives birth to Samuel. And after he is weaned, which have been, would have been around three to four years of age, she takes him back to Shiloh to the high priest where the tabernacle is. And she gives him to the high priest to live with him and to serve in the temple. What stands out in the first three chapters is chapter two. The first 10 verses record what is called the prayer of Hannah. And it's really a prayer written in the form of a song. It corresponds to the New Testament song of Mary that's recorded in Luke chapter one, where Mary also prays in, in a psalm that she's written. Uh, and it's a form of a song she prays. And, and both of these, are not just prayers in which a person uh, thanks God for something he's done for them. They, are, uh, they reach the heavens with their soaring gratitude to God for his eternal providence over all things. And Hannah, in her song, she sees her small problem, not having a child and wanting one, and the way God turned that around as simply a small example of God's eternal work and rule in this world. Now, the Song of Hannah, those 10 verses uh, contain or involve a series of contrasts between those who are proud in themselves and their own strength and those who look to God for their significance and their uh, security in life. And, and I want you to note how the psalm begins with words that urge people to make a response to the Lord, a response of trust and submission. It begins like this. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. This is the point of the psalm. Don't be like those who rely on themselves and their own strength, who view their blessings as signs of their accomplishments in life, who are arrogant and proud. God knows the heart. Now, as we walk on our journey through this world, we all uh, find that we experience the same things that people all over the world experience. Our being Christians does not keep us from experiencing many things that are just common to life in this world. 
We, like everyone, struggle at times with relationships, with our marriages and our parenting. We lose people that we love. We get sick. We are in an accident. And right now we're experiencing that. The whole world seems to be shut down by the coronavirus. And this virus seems to impact people indiscriminately and at random. And if we don't have an understanding of what Hannah says, that there is none beside you, there is no rock like our God, then this world is a mad and confusing place in which to live. But faith chooses to see God's superior hand at work in everything that happens to us. And, and faith seeks to trust God in and through it. It really is our response to God in the circumstances of life that matters. It's not the circumstances themselves, ultimately. And in everything that God allows to come into our lives, he is seeking to soften us, uh, to soften our hearts, to teach us to be more flexible and more trusting. At times, uh, well, really at all times, but when we're most troubled, we find it in the Lord the confidence that we need. There is no rock like our God. There is no trouble. There is no uncertainty. There is no coronavirus that can shake the work of God in our lives and the confidence that we have in him. May that thought, as you reflect upon it, strengthen you today.